Welcome, everybody. I hope this sermon makes a lot of you really think deeply and hard about the points we'll bring up today, about your relationship with your country. It doesn't matter if you live in America or Russia, China, Ukraine, Germany, France, Britain, Saudi Arabia. It doesn't matter. Iran, Israel. I hope this message will resonate because it will apply to you and your country. Of course, I am American, and so my my uh, points will be largely American, but the points will apply to all of you in every country. Uh, many of you come to this website from over 50 countries, and so let's get started. President John F. Kennedy once said in one of his speeches, famously said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. I'm asking you today, what do you think you can do for your country? I'm titling this, What You Must Do for Your Country. Now, here in America, we've had a blockbuster election with wide-ranging ramifications. Is this a time to be silent? Or is it a time when extra prayer should be sent up to God? For many, many reasons. Should we just remain quiet and do nothing in such a time as this? Or is our God looking for much more from us? The whole world is really teetering on a time when there can be a tremendous amount of change, negatively or even positively, although there is so much that is negative that's baked into the cake, if I can, if I can explain it that way, that we're really going to need some intervention by God if things are to change course the way they're heading? Or should we just say it's all part of prophecy? It's all going to collapse in the end. We should just shut up and pray to God about ourselves and move on. Should we just say we're part of the heavenly city above? That's our real citizenship. And just have nothing to do with our physical country. I hope you'll give this message a real listen, a real listening to because, and some real serious consideration. Yes, you can make a big difference in your country, and I'm going to explain how today. Biblically, what can you and I do for our country? And I speak to all of you listeners. In a huge way, we're citizens of two countries right now. We're a citizen of heaven above, and we also have our earthly citizenship. Paul certainly claimed to be a Roman citizen when they were about to beat him without having a prior trial. You can read about that in Acts 22. Acts 22, verses 25 to 28. I won't take the time to read it, but he was about to be beaten. And back then, if you were a Roman citizen, he was born in Tarsus, which made you a Roman citizen. And uh, without a trial, if you were beaten without a trial, the ones who ordered the beating uh, could themselves end up in terrible trouble, maybe maybe jailed, beaten, or possibly even killed. But we're also taught, and Paul also taught, that we're, we have a dual citizenship. Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, he was also a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship, uh, King James says conversation, uh, it means citizenship is from heaven above, or is of uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, so as, um, as, as you are, uh, you are a citizen uh, of, of Jerusalem above as well, if you are led by God's Holy Spirit and a child of God. I'll submit a blog or a sermon soon about our dual citizenship. Be sure to be checking out our blogs, by the way, on the website. They're short articles, but I think you'll find many of them interesting to you. And I hope this message will get you thinking about your own country and what pleases God in our attitude towards our country. Now, I don't know if everyone in America or around the world fully appreciates yet the fact that the recent election in, the, in America is by far the most reason-defying election ever in U.S. history, and I believe will have the most important ramifications uh, in the years ahead. I believe it's the most important election the United States has ever had, ever, ever. And I think time will bear me out on that. Having said that, over 40% of eligible voters didn't even bother voting. In the meantime, many of those who are complaining about it and protesting on the streets and rioting on the streets, many of those who are arrested, like 70% of those from Portland, Oregon, who were arrested, hadn't even voted. 
Of those who did vote, 59% or so voted, okay? Half the voters voted for Donald Trump and half voted for Hillary Clinton, and many, frankly, like I said, didn't vote at all. Even though God has put us in a country where we have an opportunity to select our leaders and the laws of the land, we have a voice in whether we should decriminalize marijuana, what should be taught in schools, and so on. What does the election of Mr. Trump mean to the USA and to the world and to prophecy and to the timing of everything? Frankly, who knows besides God? But let, let's let God be God. Let's not assume to speak for him unless he's whispered in your ear. So as I go through this, make sure you understand that it's all entirely up to God, but, but a lot of what God does will depend on what we, his people, do as well, as you'll see. He wants our involvement. Some believe the Trump election is a swing back to, by the way, uh, a couple days before the election, after a deep prayer, I told my wife, I re even wrote it down, the, the presidency will go to President Trump, elect Trump, and he will, um, uh, he will win the Electoral College in a, in a significant way. It won't be close. My wife said, it won't be close. I said, no, I'm just getting this really strong as I pray that it's going to be over 300 electoral votes. And she thought I was crazy, but... It ended up being 306 to 232. I said that to her two days before. If you hear my last sermon, I intimated early in the sermon uh, a hint that I was leaning that way towards Trump too. But anyway, some be I believe God was, God was putting that in my heart. Anyway, some believe this Trump election is a swing back to the right, even to righteousness. But Trump is hardly a righteous man, folks, nor does he have a civil tongue at times. Nor is he probably a true conservative in many areas of his life, and politically he's totally untested. But the alternative, Mrs. Clinton, had so much baggage and even potentially criminal uh, activity or history that she could not have been any better uh, option, really. But whatever you believe, surely you can agree on this. It's time to do something and pray deeply for our country and our leaders. Some believe God is giving us more time before the return of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want the return of Jesus Christ as soon as possible. I want the return of Jesus Christ as soon as possible. It's up to God, of course. But maybe God is giving us a final wake-up call to turn back to God. But is Trump leading in such a thing? He is a man who badly needs to be called to salvation. He is a man who does bring some impressive things to the presidency, but also a ton of baggage and a lot of sin in his background, like you and me. You and I both have all been sinners, too and in need of salvation. I hope we're responding to the call to salvation. We could pray that President-elect Trump will have his heart touched by our God. I'm praying that. And to be changed into a different man by God's Holy Spirit. It can happen if God wills it and the President-elect responds. I'm saying I sense this election could be portending something huge in the next four years. But we must not. We must not look to any man, not Trump, not Hillary, for our nation's answers, for our nation's salvation. And I believe some, so many evangelicals are doing that very thing right now. We must not look to Trump. We must look to our true leader, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, or they say in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. And I often say Yeshua is our hope <clears throat> and on whom our eyes are must be placed. God certainly placed or allowed Trump to be president. No question about that when you read Daniel 4, verse 17. God is the one who sets kings and rulers in place. And he often chooses the basest of men. Now, by the way, don't think, don't look down on Trump or anybody else as a basest of men. I will recall, I will remind you that you yourself are being called to become a ruler of the world under Christ, ruler of cities and nations. And who did God call? He didn't call the mighty and the noble. He called the base things, the weak things. That's you and that's me. Had you thought of that connection before? That Daniel 4 talks about God chooses sometimes the basis of men. And you and I are also being chosen as the, as the base things to become leaders in the world tomorrow. 
But what that exactly means, unless God has spoken into your ear directly still up in the air about what exactly God is doing. A lot could still happen. We might be thinking, wow, we're set now. We're going to get things back. We're going to uh, curb the uh, illegal immigration. Nothing wrong with legal, good, approved immigration. We're going to drain the swamp and drain corruption. I wonder how much we can thoroughly do that, though, without God's Holy Spirit. There's certainly a lot they can do, but without the Holy Spirit guiding you, how far could they really get it right? And we might start getting all excited that things are going well, maybe jobs are going up. Let's just say it does. Well, you know what? A series of natural disasters could change things in a hurry. A bullet, bullet could drastically change everything. God forbid some evil people are calling for it, even on Twitter. And then we'd have Mike Pence as our president. So don't, please don't even think that way, that Trump is either the devil in disguise, as the left believe, or is a leader sent by God to his people, uh, for his people, kind of like uh, Cyrus of Isaiah 45. Some point to that chapter 45 of Isaiah and kind of kind of connect it to Trump being president number 45. And they draw parallels to ancient Emperor Cyrus. I, I won't go there myself. I won't go there myself just yet anyway. But I will, I will say this, that it is interesting that God calls Cyrus his anointed in Isaiah 45, chosen for a special role. God had chosen Nebuchadnezzar, an evil man, idolater, Sabbath breaker, probably profane man in so many ways, to take Judah into captivity. And then God used Cyrus to restore the Jews back to their homeland. Nebuchadnezzar was also called my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, in one of the verses in Daniel. My servant. And then Cyrus was called my anointed. And they were not righteous men. So don't feel that Trump or anybody else who's a leader has to be perfectly righteous as we understand it before God can use them. Because historically, God has used leaders who were very imperfect, including King David and Samson and so many others. Of this much, I am certain. We are at a very critical juncture in our nation's history and in world history. You're part of history going on right now. I believe that. President-elect Trump will not be an ordinary president. For good or for bad, he is not going to be an ordinary president. Nothing about his campaign or his election has been ordinary. Why should that stop now, right? So you're watching history take place, and this is certain. May our God have great mercy on our nation and your nation. May he have great mercy. And what happens in America and under the leadership of President-elect Trump will affect your nation, your country, wherever you live. So we need to ask God to have great mercy because our national sins are great. Our God could be setting this all up to either be for a time of restoration, like in the days of Cyrus, or a time of terrible retribution and judgment. I feel in my heart we're going to see a time of major universal and worldwide change and upheaval, some of it for very good. But there's an underlaying in my heart, an underlaying in my heart that's saying that there's something dark and sinister being set up as well. It will be a rising up for some and a slamming down of others. Either way, it's time to pray for our nation and its leaders, as you may have never done so quite that way before. Turn to Psalm 75. Psalm 75. First remember that it is our God who decides who will be the leaders and rulers of our nations. Like it or not, that's what Scripture indicates. In Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Notice it doesn't say north. God is often referred to as being in the north sides of heaven. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. In Daniel 4.25, 
believe Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar here. It says, Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Now you're set for the rest of the sermon about your role. Turn to Second Chronicles, please. 7. This country, and frankly many countries around the world, are divided countries, hurting countries. Our nation, many other countries, are hurt. They're sick and are hurting. Have you seen on TV the people crying, weeping, even leaving the country out of uh, fear and disdain for President-elect Trump? Our nations need healing. And certainly the USA does right now. And you have a part in that. Don't shirk your opportunity to do something great for your country and be and blessed by God when you do these things. This message is about <clears throat> what each of you can do <clears throat> excuse me, to petition our God to heal our country. There are steps we can take and involves you and God. I'm going to quote a verse you've all heard, you've all probably used. But in terms of your country, have you ever really applied it? What I'm about to read was said to, by God himself in a dream to the newly crowned king of Israel, King Solomon. Second Chronicles 7, verses 14 to 15. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. So we have to humble ourselves. That's often also a uh, figure of speech for fasting. Pray. Seek me. Seek my face. Seek me. And turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And heal their land. And then Yehovah goes on to warn that if we don't do that, there would be repercussions, calamities, and trouble that will come upon our lands. To whom is this plea directed? To the whole nation? To everyone? No! No, no! He says, if my people, those called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and all that. He's addressing it to his people. Who are the people of God? called by his name. How about starting with believers, true Christians, Christians, the true Christians, people who call upon the name of the Lord. This is speaking to you. He's not putting this task and responsibility on everyday person out there or on drug dealers or on smugglers or, or whatever. No, he's putting it on you and on me. And that's the way it should be. If we will humble ourselves and seek him, there's some incredible, mighty things that just might happen for this country. Could happen. And then later on in the book of Esther, Esther, who was the wife of the Persian emperor at the time, was in a terrible situation. The emperor had just tricked, been tricked into signing an executive order, basically to wipe out all the Jews in his empire, to confiscate their lands and their wealth. Well, you know, what he didn't know was that his own wife, Esther, was a Jew. No one knew that except her uncle, or maybe he was a cousin, I don't know. But anyway, he related to her, Mordecai. And she could not approach or petition her husband, if she, even if she wanted to, uh, without risking her life. Because no one could approach the king when he was sitting on his throne without him requesting that person's presence. Not even his wives. So she was hesitant. She'd seen people killed instantly. She might have been thinking, God's in charge, and so I don't need to personally do anything about this for my people, this edict that's gone out, or my country, because God is good and, God is good and powerful, and he'll take care of all of us. I don't need to do anything. He doesn't need me. So she diddle-daddled at first, took her time. Have you ever thought that way? I don't need to say anything. I don't need to get involved, because God, God is the one who puts people up and puts people down. And yet God has always wanted us to be involved to some degree, even if it's just to watch him. But he always wants us praying. There are times he tells us to stop talking and start walking. 
You know, it's what he told Israel. At one point he said, Moses said, uh, stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. And God basically said, Moses, what are you doing? Tell him to get moving. <laughs> so go back and read that in uh, Exodus uh, 12. Anyway, Esther chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. Let's read the story. Uh, Mordecai also gave a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that's the palace area, that the servant that he was giving all this to might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Mordecai wasn't, Mordecai was a man of God, but he wasn't just thinking, well, all we have to do is pray. Uh, we don't have to do anything else. Um, we don't have to do anything. God God will work it all out for us. No, he says, Esther, you've got to go in there. You've got to plead before him for her people. Now, of course, Esther, Esther is going to do it with, with prayer. So anyway, so Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Mordecai is her relative. Then Esther spoke to uh, the, the, the messenger, Hatak, and uh, gave him a command for Mordecai. She says, all the king's servants, and I almost said all the king's men, <laughs> all the king's servants and all the people of the God of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been bidden, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not even been called to the king. I'm his wife, and he hasn't even called me for 30 days. I mean, he had other wives, remember that. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to go back to Esther and say this, Hey, Esther, wait. Don't think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. He's saying this to the queen. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now, the reason I'm reading this is, we're in a serious time in world history right now. We know it's going to get more and more serious. I know that. You know that. We know that. Don't we? All of us know that. But following this example, we need to be beseeching God and be doing something as God directs us. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from, some, from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this. Brethren, you and I have been called to the kingdom of God. And in times of crisis, who knows whether you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this as well. Tie that to Second Chronicles. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Are you getting my point? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in the palace area in Shushan, and fast for me. Fast for me. That's the humble yourselves part. And implied in that would be, pray for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, and my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. Now, brothers and sisters, think about this. Could you and I be alive today in such momentous times, not far from the return of the Son of God to rule the earth? Exciting times. Think what I just said. When God himself returns to earth to rule. We're not too many years away from that. Could you and I be alive today and do nothing for our people, for our nations? Can we at least fast for them? Can we at least pray for the nation? Or should we remain inactive, aloof, self-righteous, looking down on them? I'm glad I'm not like them, sinners, kind of attitude. Shame on us if we have that. Or should we remain inactive at all, absent from duty, remain silent at such a time as this, when our God has given us the opportunity to make our voices heard? 
Paul let his voice be heard when they were about to beat him, a Roman citizen, without a proper trial first. Had they done so, the people who ordered that could have been jailed themselves. In Acts 22, you can read that. Acts 22, 22 to 29. Acts 22. But anyway, those Jews in Shushan, the palace area in Esther's day, if you missed that last scripture, it was Esther 4, verses 7 to 16. We're being asked to fast and pray, not just for Esther, not just for the safety of the Jews, but for the evil, irascible, unpredictable, and often violent pagan emperor who happened to be the husband of Esther. They needed God to hear their prayers, that he, that he wouldn't go into a rage when when Esther entered. A lot of you have this attitude, I think, that we don't need to do anything because God's got it all figured out. We just have to watch and see what happens. Brethren, you've got to pray. Prayer, prayer does change things. Prayer does change things. Even God has changed his view on things, as you'll see as we go through here, when people prayed to him. I wouldn't be surprised if we were to find out that the man they were praying about, the emperor, I mean, was often foul-mouthed, hot-tempered, idolatrous, lecherous, brutal. But pray about him, they did. I don't think President Trump, President-elect Trump, were all those things. And of course, about the whole picture. So some people are are, are feeling, I can't pray for President-elect Trump. I can't pray for him. He's He's foul mouth, potty mouth, as I would say sometimes. And yet I'm beginning to have a lot of hope that maybe some things are about to happen. Many of you hearing this message come from a religious belief that we are not to be involved in our country. So some of you certainly would never vote. And you go to work and basically try to keep yourself from being too enmeshed in this world, in the world. So you back away from getting too close to anyone. Some of you don't even have any close friends. I mean, close friends that you bring over for dinner, that you spend time with, who are not part of your church. Am I right? Am I talking to some of you? You may know your neighbors, but they're kind of at arm's length. You uh, probably have never invited them over for dinner or become very close to them. Of course you are for Uh, You say you're doing that because they're of the world, and we are to come out of the world. But is that the example that Jesus, that Yeshua, our, our Savior, set? Did he keep arm's length from anything or anyone to do with the world, really? So what did he do? What was the example of the early church? What was their example? No, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Luke seven thirty four. Very bad people somehow felt comfortable in his presence and changed and repented because of something about him. But it wasn't a condemnation. He says, I have not come into the world to condemn the world. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Isn't that the verse right after John 3.16 or thereabouts? He did not come into the world to condemn the world. But we have many preachers out there who are spending all their time condemning everybody and condemning the world. There's a time to cry aloud, show my people their sins. In a way, I'm doing it now in this sermon. If we haven't been praying for our nation and for our leaders, I think that's a sin. In fact, it's just coming to me now. Isn't it First Samuel 8? I don't know the verse, but I think it's First Samuel 8. It might be later on in the in book of Samuel, where Samuel says to the people, he says, if I don't pray for all of you, that would be a sin. I'll put it in my notes later on. It just came to me now. If we're not praying for the country, it would be a sin. Samuel said. So I am crying aloud and telling my people their sins because I think a lot of you listening to me right now are not praying for the country, are not praying for your leaders. I don't mean praying they drop dead. (laughs) I'm not praying that they uh, disappear or something. So Yeshua said harlots and tax collectors who were responding to him 
and his message would get into the kingdom of God sooner than the religious people of his day. That's in Matthew 21, 32. Matthew 21, 32. Is that what you believe? Are you even talking to anyone about Yeshua who's not a part of your church? Are your close friends, close friends, are you close friends with or with anyone not a part of your church? Your message about Yeshua will ring the loudest and the truest, by the way, with your closest friends when they start to see, in fact, that your life, in fact, mirrors what you've been saying to them. Why miss that opportunity? Why hide the light under a bushel? Too many of you are doing that. The early church went everywhere preaching the word. It says in Acts 8, verses 3 to 5, they were scattered by persecution. The apostles stayed back in Jerusalem. So this was not a statement about the apostles. It says the early believers, the believers went everywhere preaching the word. So I hope some of you will rethink your position and realize that that we have a high calling. We have a very, very high calling. Yeshua said we're not of the world. We're not friends of the world's values. James 4.4, 4, if you're if you're a friend of the values of the world, if you're a friend of the world that way, then you're an enemy of God, James 4.4 4 says. But don't forget that our God so loved the world, the people of the world, not, the, not its values, but the people of the world that he came to die, he sent his son to die for them. If you were of God, so would you. As God did through the Son of God, so would we, hopefully. You all know John 3, 16 uh, and to 18, right? He died for the people of the world. We should be of the same mind. So, again, Yeshua said, returning to John 17 now, Yeshua said, we're not of the world, but we're being sent into the world. See, a lot of people know that verse in Revelation 18, 4, and I've even given a whole sermon on it. Come out of her, my people, out of Babylon, that you may not be partakers of her plagues and her sins and all that, okay? So, but here in John 17, when Yeshua is praying, when Jesus is praying to God the Father um, at that last Passover that he had with them, here's what he says. I'll just read it to you. John 17, verses 14 to 18. John 17, verses 14 to 18. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world. And you and I should not be of the world. Just as I am not of the world, he says. This is Jesus speaking. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. I don't want you to take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. He says it again. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So you also are being sent into the world. You are not being sent to come out of the world in the sense, in the sense that you have nothing to do with the people of the world. You're to come out of the world's ways. But like he said, he says, I don't pray you take them out of the world. Verse 15, John 17:15. And then he says, just as you sent me, verse 18, into the world, I also have sent them, that's you and me too, into the world. So let, I think God wants us involved with people. He wants us involved with what's going on. Why do I say all this? Because I strongly suspect that many of you, if you're honest with yourself, returning with me now to 1 Timothy 2, if you're honest with yourself, 1 Timothy 2, have never, ever prayed for more than a few seconds, if ever, for President Obama, for him, or for President-elect Trump, or any other government leaders. And I suspect many of you have never, ever prayed a fervent prayer for days on end, and for days in a row is what I meant to say, for our nation to repent, your nation, whatever nation you're from, Ukraine, Germany, France, Britain, Australia, Canada, where are you from? Have you prayed for your nation to repent and for God to be merciful to your country? 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 4 says here, 
Um, therefore, this is Paul now speaking, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. I exhort, that means I really encourage you strongly. First of all, that supplications, that's intense prayers of asking God to do something special for other people. And prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority. Have you ever thanked God for President Obama or President Bush or President Clinton or now President-elect Trump? We are commanded here to pray for them and give thanks for all in authority. Be made for all men and for kings and all in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in the, all godliness and reverence. You see, God's given us a country where we can actually help choose the leaders and pray for them. And as a result of that, we might, we just might get a little more peaceful way of, of worshiping God in this country, in your country. Think about that. Don't, don't make that a light thing. All I'm saying, though, is you're told to pray for and give thanks for all men and kings and all in authority. Are you getting the point? Verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is a good thing, that you pray for rulers and all in authority, and you thank God for them and ask God that they will pass laws and rule in such a way that we can all have a peace, peaceable and, and good life. Now, what is said about desiring all men to be saved, in verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, is said in context of praying for our leaders. And so now, people of God, called by his name, listen to your God, listen to your master, listen to the Apostle Paul. When Solomon was dedicating the new temple of God built in Jerusalem, the living God appeared to Solomon in a dream and said this. Remember, let's read it again. Remember, we are now the living temple of God today. If you want there to be a chance for this nation to repent, for this country, your country, to come back to God or to come to God, to God in the first place, then listen carefully. Then listen carefully. Second Chronicles 7, verses 14 to 16. I said this earlier, I want to read it again now. If my people, that's you, brethren, who are called by my name, that's you, brethren, will humble themselves as fast and pray and seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. In what place? In the temple. And you are now the temple of God. You are now the house of God. You are now the temple of God. Brethren, we have an order from God. We have instruction from God. Please listen to it. Pray, turn to him, and God, if enough of us do it, and we do it fervently enough, we just might see some dramatic changes from what we expect to be happening. The ones God calls my people. Remember when he told Pharaoh? Hey, Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. All through the scriptures in the Old Covenant, the people of God was the nation of Israel. Judah, Israel, okay, and all that. In the New Covenant, in the New Covenant, uh, we, we know, for example, in 1 Peter 2, verse 10, where Peter says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own, spe his own special people. And Paul said that all through the book of Colossians and Ephesians and all the way through there, in the book of Romans, that the one who is a Jew now is the one who is a Jew spiritually. So if you're uh, Ukrainian or if you're um, Chinese or Mexican or Filipino, it doesn't matter if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are being called to become a part of my people, the Israel of God, the Israel of God. Whether you're brown, red, black, or white, doesn't matter. The Israel of God. 
So Peter says in First Peter, in fact, at the end of Galatians 3, around verses 26 to 28, uh, he says uh, he says very clearly in there that as far as God's concerned, there's no more male or female, no more bond or slave or free or 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 any such thing. Okay, no Greek and and Gentile and and Jew and all that. He just says we're all one in Christ. We're all one in Christ, the people of God, the uh, heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Not just the not, not just the the uh, modern day descendants of Israel are, are, are heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Galatians 3, is, which I hear over and over again, that's not true according to Galatians 3. Physically, that's true. But spiritually, spiritually, Galatians 3, 26 to 28, and 1 Peter 2, 10, and, and, and many verses in Ephesians and Romans make it very clear that you Gentiles are also being called to become the people of God. So let me read again 1 Peter 2, verse 10. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You're going to be kings and priests, brethren, a holy nation, the nation of Israel of God, the Israel of God, okay? His, 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 get that, his own special people. If my people would pray, remember, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I hope you're doing that. I hope you're talking about your God and declaring the praises of him to people outside your own church. You who were once not a people, but are now the people of God. There it is. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So remember, even if you're Gentiles in China or the Philippines or Mexico or Russia, you can now be part of the people of God called by my name. The Apostle Peter himself used that verse from Amos 9.12 that he was referring to in, in the big conference they had in Jerusalem. It was centered on uh, circumcision, but also on, uh, on, on, on the law, uh, the 613 uh, rules of the law. In Acts 15, verse 17, here's what um, Peter says. So the rest of mankind, not just Jews, may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So I'm not just talking to people who feel they're descendants of ancient Israel. I am talking to anyone who hears this. If God is working with you, you may become one of those who are called my people who should be fasting and praying and seeking his face, and then God will heal your lands. Are you listening, people? God wants to hear what you have to say, and he's told us to pray for the leaders, to be friends of the people of this world, not of their ways. Jesus was a friend of sinners. How many friends, close friends, can you point to who are not part of your church? This way you can show them the light. Remember the Almighty says, my ears are attentive to prayer made in this place, referring to the temple. You cannot afford to be silent in a time like this, as he said to Esther. So is it too late, though? Are the prophecies of God already baked in the cake, so to speak? Can't change them. Returning to Amos chapter 7. Many feel the prophecies of Matthew 24 and Daniel and Revelation are so detailed that they're all cast in stone. I suspect that's probably the way things are going to work out. But nothing's impossible with God. And when you read the book of Jonah and you see the story of Nineveh, that that big city was supposed to be annihilated by God like Sodom and Gomorrah were. And when God saw them beginning to fast and turn to him, I personally doubt very much if in such a short time those people were keeping the Sabbath or obeying all the 613 laws of the, of, of, of the law. But they did enough, and God looked upon their heart, that God changed his mind. He had already spoken that in 40 days this city is going to be no more. 
they repented and sought him deeply. If enough of us would pray for God's mercy and for God's spirit to start to work a revival in the nation. Are you saying you don't believe that could happen? Well, I'm not part of that thinking. I'm thinking it very well could happen. And by the way, why don't I hear preachers preaching Amos 7? Here we see that God had begun to punish Israel. And he told Amos to prophesy something that was happening and going to continue to happen. But Amos pushed back. Amos was not even from the school of the prophets. Amos was a shepherd from Tekoa, a little tiny little village six miles south of Bethlehem. The poorest of the poor people were the ones who were the shepherds raising the sheep for and, and the lambs for the temple sacrifices. That was for the weakest, poorest people. Amos was such a person. So he's no he's a nobody. He's not he, he's not a Moses. He's not an Abraham, okay? He's Amos, a poor shepherd. Let's read it. Amos 7 verses 1 to 6. And the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, "Oh Lord God, that's Adonai Yehovah." God is in capital letters, and that's the Yahweh in this case, or Yehovah. O Adonai Yehovah, forgive, I pray. O that Jacob, that's Israel, may stand, for he is small. And so Yehovah relented concerning this. It shall not be, he said. So God changed his mind when a ordinary shepherd prophet, God likes shepherds, I think, you know, I mean, he revealed the birth of his son to shepherds. The first good, real king of Israel after Saul was David, who was a shepherd. Now this Amos was a shepherd. Thus the Adonai Yehovah showed me then verse 4. Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Great big raging fire. And I said, O Adonai Yehovah, Lord God, cease, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he's small, have mercy. He's saying, please, look, we're, we're nobody. So Yehovah relented concerning, in this case, it's one man praying. It's not, it's one man made the difference. Verse 6, so Yehovah relented concerning this. If you and I and other believers would start to pray for our country and ask God to have mercy on us and to re- and to relent from what he was going to do and to have mercy on his people. It is not too late, according to what I'm reading here. Yehovah relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said Adonai, Yehovah, the Lord God. <sighs> Are you listening, people? So many of you have been indoctrinated so much that it's too late. Well, keep listening. The Almighty relented because one poor shepherd begged him not to do what he said he was going to continue doing. He'd already started it. Can you and I not do at least as much for our people? And don't forget Abraham beseeched Jehovah about Sodom, the city. He didn't, he didn't beseech him for Lot. He doesn't say, hey, how about my nephew out there, Lot, and, and his family? Would you would you please get them out of there and save them? For No, no, he, he didn't say that. He said, if there be but 40, then 30, then 20, then 10 righteous. God says, even for 10 righteous, I will spare, not the 10, I will spare the city. Ten out of that whole city. Abraham wasn't asking that if there be 50% that repent or 51%. No, ten. And there weren't ten, apparently, who were willing to believe and have faith. You can read that whole story in Genesis 18. 
Now, some of you believe we're not, we're actually commanded not to pray for the world. Let's deal with that. Some of you know the three passages in Jeremiah. I'll put them in my notes. Where Jeremiah is told by God, Jeremiah, don't even bother praying for these people. I'm telling you, if Samuel and Moses were here, I think, I think the Satu he mentions, is that Jeremiah 15 or something like that? If even those two men were here, I, I still wouldn't listen to them either. I'm going to punish Israel. I'm go- or Judah, whatever. I'm going to get involved here, and uh, your interventions and your prayers won't make any difference. Well, they will hear that people love those three verses and say, therefore, that was an edict, a rule, a, a rule for all time. Don't pray for these people. Uh, if you want to write these down, it's Jeremiah 7:16. That's Jeremiah 7, 16, 11, 14, and 14, 11. I'm very aware of those verses. I just gave them to you. And then some will also say, and besides that, even Jesus himself said, in John 17, 9 and 20, in that same prayer I was reading to you earlier, I do not pray for the world. I pray for these, my disciples. John 17, 9. I do not pray for the world, he said there. So then people grab these verses out of context and apply them to all situations, to all people for all time, and teach that somehow we're not commanded, that we're commanded not to pray for people of the world or pray for our country, ever. Is that right? Some of you know you believe that. Some of you know you've heard that. Well, let's see, Daniel prayed for God's mercy on his people after all this was said to Jeremiah. Daniel's prayer of Daniel 9 was because the 70 weeks of slavery was supposed to be coming to an end. And in Daniel 9, Daniel admits to God that they have been sinners. And he admits his own sinfulness in Daniel 9. Daniel certainly knew about Jeremiah's ministry, but it didn't stop Daniel from praying for his nation. I'll pick up, you can read the whole thing in the whole chapter of Daniel 9. I'll I'll pick up starting verse 16, and we'll go to verse 23. Daniel 9, verses 16 to 23. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem. He's praying for his city, praying for his nation. Your holy mountain, because of our sins, And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. Remember, I just read to you, we're supposed to have supplications for all in authority. And those people who are ruling in authority are not generally believers, brethren, not 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 firm uh, Sabbath keepers and all that. They're not. But he says, Okay, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is this desolate. Oh, my God. See the my God there, by the way. We should, don't just be talking about God. Talk about my God and our God. Oh, my God. Incline your ear. Can you tilt your head towards us a little bit and hear my prayer? Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we don't, do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. So in other words, here you pray before God, you say, I know the nation isn't deserving of this. I know we're all sinners. And I'm not going to you because I'm saying that we're, that we're righteous. I'm not. I'm going to you, great God in heaven, our Father, our, our, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I come to you not because of any good things we have done, but because of your great mercies. It's like that's what Daniel's saying here. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay your own for your own sake, my God. My God. For your city, your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yehovah, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. My God. I want you to pick that up. That really helps you become more familiar with God and intimate. When you start talking about my Father and my God, our Father in heaven and so on. 
Anyway, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in a vision in the beginning, this was the angel, an archangel, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked to me. And he said, Daniel, I've come now to show you and uh, to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Brethren, whether or not God hears your prayer to spare your country, to spare America, to spare Britain, to spare Canada, what I read from this is that God is greatly moved when you and I pray for his mercy to be extended to our country. Can you not do that? Get off your high horse if you think that you that it's all baked in the cake and can't change. If it doesn't change, it might be because not enough of us were praying for it. David certainly asked God over and over, King David, to involve himself more in the nation's problems. Look at Psalm 44, verses 23 to 26. I'll just write these down. Psalm 79, verse 5. Psalm 85, verse 5 to 7. There's so many. Isaiah certainly did. I'll read Isaiah 64, verses 8 to 12. Isaiah 64, verses 8 to 12. But now, Jehovah, you are our father. You're our father. You're our daddy. We're just, we're just clay, and you're the potter. And all we are the work of your hand. Don't be furious, Jehovah, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look. We're just your people. We're all your people. Isaiah 64, verse 10 now. What I'm saying here is when you pray for President Trump, Pray that God will give him a heart to hear God's word. That he will listen to people who are telling him, you have a great responsibility to rule this people. You might want to hear my last sermon on a message to the president-elect. It was really for President Trump. If you'll pick up what I said early in the sermon there. President-elect Trump. Ask God to soften his heart. Ask God to speak to him. Ask him to help him be responsive, to give him a pliable heart. Some great things that could happen. A lot of it depends on if you will pray. A lot of it happens on if you will pray. I hope you'll tell people about this sermon. Tell them to hear it because we've got to get this message out. Your holy cities. Okay, Isaiah 64, continuing, verse 10. Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion's a wilderness. Jerusalem's a desolation. Our holy and beautiful people, temple, I mean, where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Yehovah? Will you please stop? Will you please hear us? That's what Isaiah's saying. Look at the guts he's got to talk to his maker like that. Will you restrain yourself because of these things? Our Savior himself, did he pray for the world? On the cross, Luke twenty three thirty four. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, Abba, forgive them. Talk about praying for people who were spitting on him, hurting him tremendously, torturing him, blaspheming him. Father, forgive them. Can you pray that for your country? Father, forgive the United States. Forgive Britain. Forgive Russia. Whatever nation you're from, pray for your country. Paul said he would give up his own salvation if it meant all Israel could be saved. I'd rather be accursed. I could be accursed, he said. Romans 9.3. Then Romans 10.1, Brethren, my heart's desire 
and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Is that your heart's desire? Be honest with yourself and repent deeply if it hasn't been. And prayer to God for your country is that they may be saved. I beg you to start praying that prayer. Can you and I not say the same as Paul? Come on, brethren. Are you listening? Paul openly states he prayed to God. Prayed to God for his people. Surely we can do the same. Are some of us so late of sin that we just can't bother? Are we so asleep and blind and naked and wretched that we can't put out a zealous prayer for our country? Wake up, people. Wake up. I'm not saying for the nation to wake up. I'm saying for God's people to wake up. And in the end, doesn't God feel pleased to see your heart as one of full of concern or love for your country, your people? After all, that was his heart. Beg God to help us have his heart that he so loved the world and he didn't come to condemn but to save. And so he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes on him would be saved. Beg him to let you feel hurt for the things that hurt him. Beg him to let you feel anger for the things that anger him. Beg you to let him let you feel gentleness and love for the things that give him those feelings. We must become more and more like our God. Pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you. Pray for him to fill you. The point of this sermon comes down to this. You, what's your name? You have a great power to affect what happens to your friends and neighbors and your country if you will wake up out of your stupor and pray for your country and pray for the leaders of your country, even the ones you don't agree with, even the ones you don't like, and quit this thing of putting miserably disrespectful Facebook postings of leaders you don't like, mocking and ridiculing them. Stop it. It's wrong. Honor the king, Peter said. Honor all men. Give thanks for all men. If you and I can't care enough to pray for our country, woe be to you and to me. Remember what uh, Mordecai said to Esther. Don't think that if you remain silent now that you'll be safe, but you and your father's house will perish and help will come from somewhere else. Who knows that you were put in this position for such a time as this. And I'm saying Mordecai's words to all of you. So whether you believe you should vote or not, that's between you and God. But it's clear from Scripture, at least, that you should be praying for your leaders. Pray for the wisdom, their wisdom, to guide the nation. Pray for their morality to lead by their example. You know, when one of our presidents... And the discussion was the kind of sex that was going on in the Oval Office. And there was all kinds of stuff that even got down to the children and teenage level. And then that kind of sin and that kind of sexual immorality and fornication began to be practiced more openly. In the same way, a moral leader can lead by example and bring the nation back up. Pray for humility for them to admit their weakness to and their faults and to and to ask for, be willing to ask for forgiveness. Pray for protection for them, from those who wish them harm. There's many who do. Pray as a consequence that we believers can live a more peaceable life. All of this should be part of our daily prayers. Pray that God will have mercy on our people, just as Daniel and Isaiah and even Christ did. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Did they really not know what they were doing as they spit on him? They may not have known he was the son of God, but they knew they were doing wrong. But he was very magnanimous. Pray that he that God give our people a heart to repent. Pray that he moves in the hearts of enough people that we just might see a huge change, brethren, in what we thought was inevitable. And if God doesn't relent, then so be it. But in the end, I think God is moved when he sees us moved by the plight of our nation and our people. 
And remember Ezekiel 9, the ones who were spared, spared punishment in Ezekiel 9 and were marked for protection were those who what? Who sighed and cried for the abominations in the land. And remember Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, hint, folk, that's you, called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, your wicked ways. If you will turn from your wicked ways. We all have wickedness still in our lives, whether it's the way you keep or break the Sabbath. Or maybe you're getting your, you're, you're letting your mouth get too potty mouthy and you're using F words now. Don't do that. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Or you're starting to use God's name in vain. Oh my, you know, and that sort of thing. Don't do that. That's wickedness. We have to turn from our wicked ways. Or maybe we're getting too casual with sex. Or maybe we're doing one thing or the other. I certainly have my share of things to continue to pray about and to overcome. God says, you turn from your wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Folks, our poor earth and its countries need healing. Please do pray. And get involved with more people, especially people who don't go to your church, who don't know our Savior well enough. Let them come to know you and how Yeshua lives in you. I'm going to move to a community soon, God willing, that has more people nearby that I can interact with so we can have more social contact and influence and talk to more people about Yeshua and what's happening. That's my hope, my hope anyway. Where we are now is I'm, I'm very uh, cut off from people. Don't limit your contact and influence just to church people is what I'm trying to say. That's so narrow-minded. Please. So what can you do for your country? John F. Kennedy says, don't ask. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what, your, what you can do for your country. What can you do? A lot. A lot. Get God's involvement more in your life and your country. Pray fast and seek him. Pray for the leaders, and who knows? You just might be part of an Amos 7-like experience where God himself relents because of your prayer. That God himself relents from doing something he was going to do because of your prayer, because you cared, because you prayed, because you humbled yourself, because you begged God to have mercy. I'll tell you, when Hurricane Matthew was coming through here, about 50 minutes before it was supposed to start lashing the county I was in and my house and everything else, I'd, I'd evacuated out and I had been awakened uh, an hour before all that was supposed to happen by, by my grandson crying. And uh, we were visiting with, uh, we'd evacuated to my daughter's house. And I got to tell you, brethren, while we, my wife was changing him, I looked on my weather map thing and it was scary as can be. There were supposed to be 12 to 16 hours of sustained wind shambles. In fact, the, the forecast was so serious that our county had declared the entire next day, it was Friday, it was Friday of uh, October the 7th, they had declared that it would be a uh, curfew, and anybody who was uh, out there on the streets uh, could be ticketed and cited, because they were expecting there to be so many down trees and, and, and power lines. They didn't want people out there. Well, at uh, 1 a.m., the, the, the lashing of the winds was supposed to start at 2 a.m. At 1 a.m., I began to just pray really, really hard as can be, and I know many others were. And I'm not taking the credit for it. I'm just saying I, I did this, and, and, and others did it too, I'm sure. I know others were praying. And I just said, Father, in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name, I said, Hurricane Matthew, I order you out to sea. And Father in heaven, have mercy, not just on my house, but put a bubble around our home for 50 miles. And it was within minutes of that prayer, I kid you not, that that hurricane skipped out 50 miles to sea. And we were spared in our county. You wouldn't even know there's a hurricane the next day. God cares when you care enough to pray, not just for your house. Remember the principle of James, where it says, pray for one another that you may be healed. 
So pray for one another that other people's homes that the hurricane. So that's what I was doing. I was saying, Father, please put a 50 mile bubble around our home. Spare everybody, all the whole neighborhood and the people in trailer courts and all of that. Mobile homes. And God did. God absolutely answered that prayer. And so because you cared, because you prayed, because you humbled yourself, because you begged God to have mercy on your nation, you and I could see some great things if people will get this message out and talk to others about it and start to do it. Are you listening, people? Now, please, family of God, go pray for your country as you never have before and pray for even President Trump and Mike Pence and his wisdom uh, to select people, Trump's, you know, the right people, that God will bless this nation and have mercy on us. Because if he doesn't, brethren, a time of worse trouble, worse than the world's ever seen is what's coming. Thank you, family of God. Father in heaven, come before you, our dear Abba, our Father. We live in momentous times. First and foremost, we pray, send Jesus Christ, please. Send him back as ruler, as king of kings, as soon as, he, as, soon as you will. But in light of this message today, which I feel is your heart, we pray, Father, for President-elect Trump that you will change his heart. Father, he's had a very dirty mouth. We pray you clean up his mouth like you did Isaiah. We pray that you will touch his heart and change him into a different man and begin to help him lead this country in a way that will be just remarkable. If that's not your will, then show us that that's the case and show us that extremely hard times are coming then. And we just pray that you will have mercy on all of us. And like Psalm 91, that we don't have to fear. Whatever's happening around us, you're going to be there protecting us. Either way, we look to you. We pray that you have mercy on our countries. I pray for the United States most of all. Father, my wife is English. You will pray, so I pray also for Britain and Canada, where my children were born. And Father, just all these nations, please have mercy on your people, on people generally. They know not what they do. Forgive them, Father. And thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.